I'm Liz. Hi, you all know me. Everybody who's on this call so far knows me anyway. Um, I'm just going to open with a big thank you. It is amazing what everybody has been doing. It's everybody who has been on a phone bank, did a lit drop, wrote a postcard. I told Nancy, it doesn't show up on the website yet, but I went in before the meeting and put my somethings in for this week. So we broke 28,000. And we did 30,000 for the whole campaign two years ago, I think, right, Nancy? Something around 30,000. So we bumped our goal to 40,000 and we're thinking we're going to make it because this is our big push. There's a lot of stuff going on now, but I thank you all hugely. I thank you all for making donations because we met our matching funds goal with Indivisible National again, which means the first $350 that were donated were matched. So that's a lot of postage, guys, for our Get Out the Vote campaign. So it's a lot of postcards and it's a lot of postage. So fantastic. Another swing left. We are in the competition, you know, the phone bank competition. And of course, we adopted Denise. And we are far and above the rest of the groups. I am just telling you, we're the only ones who have surpassed our goal. And we have put in more hours than anybody else. And even though when they send out their silly newsletters and they invite people to join phone banks, Denise isn't one of their chosen candidates. They did write to me today and say, because I wrote and said, why are Denise's not down here? Because I'd forgotten there were two layers to this campaign. And the, Denise is in there because she's adopted by SWIM, the statewide indivisible group. And she said, oh yeah, but I did look at the numbers and wow, you guys are really rocking it. You're beating everybody. So most of the people that are doing that are on this call. So thank you, thank you, thank you. So all of that said, I'm going to pass it over to Sherry because I think it's really nicer to be introduced by someone who's actually met you and she will introduce our speaker. Well, I haven't met like so many other things. I haven't met Brittany face to face, but I was on the swim uh, meeting that she led the other day. And I just want to piggyback briefly on what, um, what Liz said, because if there's one thing this group has worked hard on over the past three and a half years, it's registering people to vote and getting them moving towards that really important thing about voting. We've registered thousands of high school seniors. We've worked hard on Prop 2 and Prop 3 in 2018. You know, thousands of postcards, as Liz said, to promote the vote and to vote, vote early. We've done all that legwork. And quite honestly, we work so hard. And now we're facing voter suppression. We're facing a slowdown at the post office. We're facing a pandemic. And because of all the work that we've done to register and move people to the polls, we want to make damn sure every one of those votes is counted. And our guest tonight is going to talk to us about what the plan that the Michigan Democratic Party has for making sure that happens, ask, uh, answer our questions, and let us know how we can help. So I'm really happy to introduce Brittany Albal, the Deputy Voter Protection Director of Programs for the Michigan Coordinated Campaign. So welcome, Brittany. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, and thank you for all of the amazing work that you have done so far. Um, I heard the mention of 2018, we would not be where we are today, um, if not for 2018 and, and the place that that put us. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that information and how voting has changed. Feel free to throw questions up in the chat. Um, I won't look at them while I'm presenting, but we'll be happy to go through them at the end um, and then can again answer any other questions. So obviously you all know why Michigan is so important. We were so close uh, into being able to be on the good side of things. I hate when people say turning Michigan blue. We've always been blue. We just had a little bit of a slip up back in 2016 where we lost by those 10,704 votes. We're gonna make it up this year. The coordinated campaign slog slogan this year is leave no doubt. I absolutely love it because that's what we're gonna do. We're not only gonna win, but we're gonna make sure that we win by a margin that we absolutely leave no doubt. So obviously our electoral goals are not just the president and that's what we're, we're here to do. We're not just to elect Joe Biden and, and get those 270, but we're here to make sure that we can elect Gary Peters 
rep. Alyssa Slocken is my own personal rep, so I definitely feel a tie to making sure that she wins along with Haley Stevens and being able to flip those four house races so that we're able to be back in the majority and that uh, Governor Whitmer has the support in the legislature. So we're all about winning, right? So what is the voter protection program doing to make sure that we get there? I like to talk about our program in three buckets of work. We have our election operations, we have voter education, and we have protecting the vote of actual individual voters. The mission of the Michigan Democratic Voter Protection Team, as I said, is to elect Joe Biden up and down the ticket. Um, and we do this by recruiting volunteer attorneys and others to help with our early vote programming, our election day observing, staffing our hotline and making sure that voters have access to the ballot um, are able to cast a vote and that that ballot is counted. So to go back to election operations, the first thing that we do, this is actually making sure that there is expanded access to the ballot. So 2018 really changed that for us. Um, we now have where everybody can vote by mail. So a lot of our work now is making sure that there are drop boxes working with local clerk's offices and having conversations about how many drop boxes they're going to have, how many satellite offices are going to be open for early in-person voting, making sure that all of the staff is trained to understand what absentee in-person voting is. We actually had a voter today call us on our hotline and say that their clerk's office told them they could not vote in person before election day. We got the clerk on the phone and the clerk's like, no, that's not correct. We're ready to go. It was so clearly a miscommunication between the clerk and their staff. Uh, so just making sure that we're having conversations. Um, Michigan is unique in the sense that it's not our 83 county clerks that are administering the election, but over 1,500 local cities and townships. Each clerk has a lot of control over how their election is run. So we are working, we have about 80 of our priority precincts that uh, are priority cities and townships that are, we have partnerships with our clerks and we have local leads constantly reaching out to them and talking to them about these issues uh, and making sure that they're ready for election day um, and ready to count those ballots after election day. So our second big bucket is voter education. So we do this in multiple different ways. One, I'm here tonight talking with all of you and honored to do so. Another and our big way that we do this is through our voter protection hotline. So just, just shut down a little bit ago, but on Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., our voter hotline is taking calls uh, from Michigan voters that are asking questions like, how do I register to vote? How do I apply for my absentee ballot? Why have I not received my absentee ballot? I am disabled and live at home and I cannot go to a clerk's office how do I get an absentee ballot application delivered to me? So we're constantly um, taking in calls, um, working with the field team so that when they're doing outgoing calls to the volunteers that we are able to provide voter information. And all of our hotline is volunteer run. Um, so we have volunteers answering calls. It is great to be able to see, you know, a one person being able to feel like they've empowered another person to be able to vote, which is the way we say our hotline. Right before the election day, we will have talked to at least 10,000 of those people to be able to make sure that we're able to turn out the, those voters that matter. Um, and our third is protecting the vote, which is what I do every day. Um, and it's building our program. So building our on the ground force to make sure that everybody is able to vote and vote safely. So we are ramping up our efforts right now for early vote observing. So Michigan is not used to having this big opportunity of having absentee in-person voting um, where we're starting September 24th. So we are gonna have um, a huge program for that and then obviously election day. So we're gonna get a little bit more into this, but we have three major volunteer opportunities with our program. Um, the first is volunteer recruitment. So we have folks actually right now on a phone bank uh, making calls with our staff through our list of folks that have actually at some point said that they would volunteer with us. So it's an extremely friendly list. So they may have said that they would volunteer last week, or they may be folks that volunteered with us in 2016 that just need to call back and say, hey, thank you so much for helping us in 2016. Uh, there's even more on the line now. Can you come help us? Uh, so we are doing volunteer recruitment. Also, it's uh, like 
fantastic folks like yourself who have three friends that they can call and email and walk next to the grocery store socially six feet apart through your mask and ask and say, hey, I'm helping out with our voter protection team. Can you as well? So that's what our first mission is, is volunteer recruitment. Second, as I mentioned, is our hotline. Uh, so every Wednesday and Saturday, we have trainings that we will do for you. We will train everybody on technology. Um, and we have our staff is our hotline director and deputy director are super patient in making sure that everybody is trained and fully understands the technology to be able to accept incoming calls on your computer. Now that we're all Zoom experts these days, uh, and then also to be able to walk through all the information that you need to know about Michigan voting rules, those important deadlines, and any information that you need to know. And then, as I mentioned, our third is actually being at the polling locations. So while we have been able to transition so much of this election virtually, the one thing that we cannot do virtually is be at polling locations to make sure that everybody is able to cast that ballot that counts. And we know how much hard work you all are doing to be able to get people to the polls, um, and we want to make sure that we finish that work. And we know that the Trump team is going to be spending all of their money. We've got over $20 million that's going to be pumped just into uh, what they call protecting against fraud. So again, these are the opportunities that we have. Our poll observers, eyes and ears on the ground, um, also going to be at our absentee counting boards, um, counting ballots starting on election day. Um, we know that this is probably going to drag into after election day. Our hotline volunteers, and then, as I mentioned, our recruitment volunteers. Who can be a voter protection volunteer? While many of our veteran volunteers are attorneys, you do not need to be an attorney. Um, so anybody is able to. Um, you also don't need to be a Michigan voter. So I actually talked to an indivisible group in Chicago last week and an indivisible group in California the week before. So lots of our hotline volunteers, um, you know, kind of one of the slight silver linings of this pandemic is that, you know, we are able to volunteer all across. Uh, and so we have people being able that are in safe red states or safe blue states to be able to help our battleground state. So you do not need to be in Michigan. Um, to be actually a poll observer, we actually have some folks coming in from out of town. In-state poll challengers will be the ones that are able to actually talk to poll workers, but our out-of-state friends will still be able to be in location. Um, and then just a note, I know that I've talked about some, I've, there was a note about poll workers. Um, you are not allowed to be a poll worker and a poll observer on election day. Um, so if you were signed up to be a poll worker, you can help us with early vote. Uh, you can help us with hotline, but on actual election day, you have to be one or the other. Um, and then I think the big, they are both super important. Obviously, one of the bigger distinctions is that they will pay you to be a poll worker. We are unable to pay our volunteers, um, but you know, I think everybody is going towards making sure that we protect uh, a little D democracy while also getting big D Democrats elected. So you all are probably experts, but just in case anybody is not aware, in 2018, we passed some really great things. As I mentioned, all registered voters are, can vote early by absentee ballot, including first time voters, which is a game changer for our student population. Um, you're able to vote from September 24th through November 2nd at your clerk's office or by mail. Um, and then really important and please um, I'm looking all of you in the eye. Promise me you will tell one friend, one family member, that their ballots need to be received by 8 p.m. on election day. In the primary in August, the number one reason that people's ballots were rejected was not because of signature matching, was not because of voting incorrectly, well, it was because their ballot was not received on time. In Michigan, you must have it received on time. It does not matter when it was postmarked, it must be received by 8 p.m. on election day. Uh, as I mentioned, we also have a no voter registration deadline because of the great work that you and your colleagues have done to be able to pass Prop 3. Um, and so now you are able to register to vote at your clerk's office um, on election day in those 14 days leading to election day. Uh, and you're able to vote right there at the clerk's office or at your polling precinct. This is our hotline. Um, please share it wide. Um, with anybody that may have any issues. 
this has been really critical for you know helping individual voters but also it is a great way for if someone sees something that is happening um, you may have read the news a couple of weeks ago there was that super super heinous racist robocall going around that was spreading false information that if folks registered to vote or applied for an absentee ballot that they would be on a bail watch list, that they would be on creditors list. Um, and we were able to find out about that super quickly from our hotline. So we were able to hear from different districts that that was sent to, be able to get really good information um, from our voters that are concerned about themselves and others. So two major ways, like I said, that you can help um, is one in person to be a poll observer. And then we have Again, our remote hotline shifts and phone bank shifts. We would love for you to join us in any capacity that you can, uh, knowing that we and recognizing that we are in a pandemic, um, but we're also while in a pandemic facing an election um, that we know that if we don't get a new president, the pandemic could get worse. Um, so with that, I will stop sharing my screen and head over. Oh, thanks for sharing the hotline number. I appreciate that. And also our form. If anybody wants to unmute themselves and ask questions, I'm happy to do that. Uh, and then we'll let Sherry take it away. We want to work in the absentee ballot part of the election. Is it best to try to go through this mobilize.us or should we call, we live in the Highlands, so should we call Tammy Flowers to see if we can set something up that way? Do you want to, oh, so this is the same as being um, in, do you want to be a poll observer or do you want to be a poll worker counting, right? So they're going to have two things. They're going to have people actually counting the ballots and then our team is going to be there checking the work of the people counting the ballots. Okay, so it involves being at a polling location is what you're saying for both of those jobs? No, so the absentee counting centers are going to be separate locations depending on where you are. Um, so in some cities and townships, um, Detroit is one of the best examples. Um, every ballot from the city of Detroit is going to go to the TCF center and that's where it's counted. So uh, depending on where you live, um, and some of them you're going to be counted like in the basement of your clerk's office, or some of them are going to be counted in like a bigger location. So um, I know all of Oakland County, they have an opt in for if you want to have all of them go to the same place. So it just depends on where exactly you live. Um, but if you want to count them, you would want to reach out to your local clerk's office. If you want to be there, but then reviewing it, um, you would want to go through us because um, all challengers have to be credentialed by um, the state party. Okay. So you have to be trained like like a um, poll worker. It's the same training as a poll worker to count absentees. Yes. So that's it. it um, that's going to be it. Like I said, to actually count the absentee ballots, you're going to go through your clerk's office. They right. Will do whatever process that is um, to train you, hire you, you apply for, you know, almost like a job, like you would a regular, um, any job, um, and they go through their process. Okay. And you can go through the Secretary of State. I think it's up on our Facebook page. It'll be in the next newsletter. And then you can just say that you're willing to go wherever you're needed. So you'll most likely be asked to go to Detroit. Or you can say, I'll go anywhere in Oakland County. So you can go through your individual clerk or you can go through the Secretary of State has a big program right now to try to find poll workers for areas that are more in need. So there's a couple of different ways of what you want to do is work at the polls. So Liz, has there been any headway or movement with us forming a indivisible group of, you know, finding who wants to go to where it's most needed, like in Detroit, to go to the TCF to count the absentee ballots. Uh, we've all filled out that form. Do we have anything else we can or should be doing to try to get all, us together as a group to go down there? We're not sure. I think that will be something that we can bring up at the actual trainings. Okay. So if you went through the, the Secretary of State's and applied, you will get a second, they finally fixed the system. When I got my acceptance and here, go sign up here at Detroit, it was not working, but it wasn't me. I was sure it was me, people who know me in computers, I was sure it was me. 
but it wasn't. I wasn't getting the not, I'm not a robot icon, and that is now on the form. So if you haven't gotten that yet, you'll probably get it in the next couple of days. Fill that out, and then once we do training, I think that's, according to the person at the Secretary of State, that's the time to try to organize a group to like either be at TCF to count ballots or if you want to be challengers, it's easy to do through Brittany's group and, you know, go together if we want to be challengers in a much needed area, right? My understanding is we could put a group together to do that. So it's just a decision on your part, what you want to spend your day doing. <laughs> so. Exactly. And people ask me all the time, like, which one should they do? They're both essential. We need both to be able to make sure that people are able to vote and are able to cast a ballot. Um, so it is in entirely up to you. Um, and we also will be placing people at our priorities, right? So we are running a giant program where we're going to have over 1,500 people on the ground, and half of those people are going to be in Wayne County. Brittany, um, when you had that last slide up there, um, you had the michigandems.com voter pro, and then under that was for signing up for the hotline. It was a HTTP, it was www, and that's as far as I got. Yep, um, I'll drop it in the chat. It's our mobilized link, so you're actually able to sign directly up for our training. Okay. And it looks like uh, Jonathan just dropped uh, to be a poll worker. So this is our mobilized link. Um, and that there you can sign up on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and, and Sundays. We have our phone banks as a room. And then on Wednesdays and Saturdays is when we have our hotline training. And then you can do hotline shifts Monday through Saturday. If you decide to be a poll worker, we can still sign up for your training so we just have extra knowledge for the um, poll observer or challenger? Yeah, feel free to do so. Um, if you want to do that, just reach out to us and let us know um, okay. because we usually only make the trainings like, you know, we'll, let, we'll have them be available. They'll be, again, as an open Zoom. And so just reach out to us and let us know that you're doing that. But, you know, essentially we are going to be, uh, most of our training is letting people know all of the rules, making sure, and a lot of what we're doing, right, is, is not only going to be there to make sure that um, if the Trump has challengers there, but also we know that, you know, some of the mis some of the things that are going to potentially disenfranchise voters are just mistakes um, that are made, not in bad faith, by some of the poll workers, right? Like they may have not understood a rule. Um, one of the common things that I talk about is, you know, when you go when you start to vote, the first thing they ask you is for your photo ID. But if you do not have a photo ID, you are able to sign an affidavit that says that I do not currently have a photo ID and you are still able to vote, no strings attached. Um, and if a clerk makes it unclear, um, and so somebody at, you know, says you're unable to vote without an ID, um, then that you know, voter could be disenfranchised, but it's not the same you know, as you know, with malice, <laughs> making sure that someone's unable to vote. So uh, yes, we are definitely a big proponent of training and making sure that poll workers um, know all the rules uh, and everybody is able to vote. I have to say, I've done their challenger training and because I did, I was a challenger in the spring and it is amazing. I thought I knew a lot. I learned stuff. I knew more than the poll workers, but I was at a poll where they were really good. I mean, they were awesome. And when I went over and said, well, really you could, do this, they were like, oh, great, really? Okay, they like hired me. I was the person who had to look up what precinct people had to go to if they were in the wrong place, because I knew how to do that on my phone and they did not, they, if they couldn't get through to their clerk's office, they did not know how to do that. It was a really positive experience for me, but it is an amazing training. You will learn so much. And we are improving it, um, knowing that like most of our, you know, our trainings before were in person, uh, and so for the August election, we did our first virtual training um, and we are improving it to make it uh, even better. Brittany, yes. uh, about when will you start training for the poll observers? So we are going to be start training this Sunday for early vote because um, early vote is going to be a little bit different, right? So the perfect segue for me to talk about early vote. Um, so early vote is essentially on September 24th, each clerk's office should have ballots available. 
So what we're going to have essentially for you is a checklist to just go into a clerk's office should take you no less than an hour, but essentially we want you to go make sure that they have ballots available. Make sure that they know what they're asking, make sure that they know people are able to register um, and just kind of talk to your clerk and ask some questions. Um, one of the things we're also making sure is that the clerk's offices are open. Um, in some areas, the clerk's offices are closed due to COVID and they have weird rules. So we just wanted to make sure that we have all that knowledge so that we're able to share it with voters. Um, so we'll be doing a training starting this Sunday for early vote observing. Um, so if you've never been in our program before, I would highly encourage you to sign up for early vote. Like I said, it's an hour. Um, you, you walk up, you know, to a clerk's office, you can potentially also vote if that's what you, you know, if you want to vote in person, um, you are able to do so. Um, if you have not applied for your absentee ballot, you'll be able to get a ballot there, vote in person. Um, and so you're able to kill two birds with one stone. Help us again and protect literally DG democracy while casting your ballot. Um, our full um, election day training, we will be starting in October, like early October. Okay. One more okay. time, can you review with us where we would go to sign up for that training on Sunday? Um, so you can actually head right to that Mobilize, my last link there. Um, okay. uh, and it's mobilize.us slash MIDEMS VOPRO, V-O-P-R-O. Okay, very good, thank you. I have another question. Is the training um, or the poll observing that you do on election day, uh, is that a full day or is it a half day? Are there shifts? Is it like poll workers where they go all day or? We prefer that you do all day just because it's easier for us to be able to figure out like who's going to be there. Um, you're able to build a relationship with the poll workers. I think what Liz talked about was like really great is that, you know, you do, in the morning we say like introduce yourselves like the better the relationship you have um and so we ask that you can do it full day but we also understand that it just does not work for some people my mother's doing it and she can't be standing that long or you know just like she has to work a little bit so we understand um and so it will be we'll essentially do half day shifts um the one thing i'll add is if you're doing our absentee counting boards um which we know is of great interest um it, they are not open to the public and you must be in the absentee counting board um, building until the polls close. And take cookies. <laughs> Just barely pre-COVID. Like I was there, it was election day was the day before everything started shutting down. And if you take cookies, it's great. They love you. So. That was Erica's suggestion and it worked really well. Yeah. Janice, did you have a question? I want to know, um, the, there's uh, three pieces of legislation that are currently either in the House or the Senate, and I really want to make people aware that we should be calling our legislators. Um, I mean, are you aware of them? And is something going out in the newsletter? Maybe Sherry, uh, Sherry you might be the one that would know about. Yeah, um, I, I just posted it today. And um, okay. I on our member page and I'll make sure that it gets on uh, in Jonathan's newsletter but um, yeah I'll put down Maddox, Berman and Runstead's phone numbers and the in the list of all the bills there are three senate bills and four house bills so I'll make sure okay. that gets up and yeah. uh, I was going to put it in the chat but thanks Janice for bringing it up and I'll make sure it's on the Facebook page right. so because one thing I was very concerned about, you know, I was a poll worker for the um, primary and I saw how many ballots were kicked back to people because they'd filled them out wrong. And then they had the choice. Did they want to uh, get a new ballot so they could fix it or just uh, vote it at is, as is and not have some of it count? I also read that many absentee ballots were, were thrown out or disqualified because the signatures didn't match or they were wrong. And one of those bills deals with that issue is that uh, I think clerks should call people and say. So they're required to. Let me let me hop in there. They are okay. required to oh. also call. Um, so we actually helped. Um, we are able. We get information about um, from the voter file of who's. They are able to check the envelope and do the matching. What the bill? Um, one of the bills that is that's actually finally getting some traction. Um, is to take the ballot with the secrecy envelope out of the external envelope. 
So that's the one that's really getting some traction um, starting in the, in the past couple of days. Um, because basically that allows us to be able to start, they'll be able to start doing that on Monday rather than Tuesday. Generally right. at 7 a.m. is when they're able to start counting ballots and that includes taking them out of the outer envelope. So the only thing they're able to do before Tuesday on election day is verify the signature. Um, so this will allow them to be able to take them out of the envelope, kind of you know organize them to be able to put them um, into the piles to be able to have the tabulators take them out of the secrecy envelopes. So we'll be able to speed up the process drastically. But the clerk's offices are supposed to be giving their best effort to call and notify people if their signature does not match or if the, the most common is if they don't sign it. And so we actually um, did some work on our team in August calling people and letting them, you know, making sure. And most people that we talked to, the clerk had actually called them and they had already gone to the clerk's office and did sign um, and okay. make sure that they were properly signed. Another issue that I saw frequently is uh, in sections where it says choose two and people would choose three, then it was kicked back. And so either that section wouldn't count for them or they could change it. Is that going to be included in that legislation? Do you know that type of, or is it only signature errors? I'm not 100% sure, but again, we would not be able to open the ballots before election day. Right. So there's you know, nothing we're able to do there. Again, the signatures are on the outside envelopes. So that's why edits are be able to made, be made, um, but the legislation would not allow us to, or not allow the clerk to actually look at the ballot. Right, okay, thank you. Um, and I will say that in the presidential primary, one of the main issues of people's ballots being tossed is because they were voting for both parties. Do you think, Brittany, that it helps to track your ballot, though, if you're not sure if your clerk is one that's going to get around to calling? Because if you know you dropped it off and two weeks later it doesn't say, you know, received. Yes, 100%. I encourage everybody. Um, you can go to um, Michigan gov slash vote um, and you can check the status of everything right so right now mine says that I applied for my absentee ballot. Um, they will let you know when they send your ballot when you've received the ballot, um, but that's a really good point that if you know you dropped off your ballot um, and it is not considered received that means that there was an issue on it. So then that likely means that you did not sign it or it might have been a mismatch. Carol. I, well, that brings up a question. So if there was, for example, a signature mismatch and you checked online and your ballot was received, that would mean it has already cleared that hurdle. There's no... Correct. I will say in some municipalities, there is a, a quick, a, a brief lag when they may mark it as received um, and then they do the signature match. Um, so there's some, there's some municipalities that do not enter anything until they've done the signature match. Um, but there are some that we've noticed where you may be received and then like really quickly after not. Um, so I would definitely just do a double check um, and not just check once. But I, that's a very few municipalities, but I just want to make sure um, and let folks know that, that that has happened. But if you're looking to um, anything with our program, um, you can sign up, like I said, through our form or email me um, and I will drop my email again in the chat and um, I'm sure, and if there's a follow-up, Sherry Elizabeth um, can, can also include my email and that information. Well, I really hope that some of you join us um, on election day. Like I said, we are building towards the largest program that Michigan has ever had. Um, as we know, all attention is on Michigan right now. Um, the vice president was here today. Trump is here. Um, you know, we are just uh, our team meeting this morning. Uh, the state director was talking about how this is one of the biggest ad buys he's seen in a state. Um, so attention is here on Michigan, uh, but we can't do it alone. So we definitely need all of your help. So whether it's from your home answering those hotline calls or if you're able to uh, put on a mask and, and meet us at the polls, we, we would love to see you. We had hoped that what we would do next is break up into some small groups and each group has somebody in it who's either been a poll worker or a poll challenger and see if we generated any more questions. Do you have the ability to stick around for a few more minutes? We would just yeah, like pick away for say 10 minutes and come back with any more questions for you? Yeah, perfect. So we'll just take about 10 minutes to kind of chat in small groups then. 
We should have everybody back now. Okay. Great. So how many rooms did we have, John? Uh, five. Okay. So room five, go first. I gave them an overview of what to expect if you decided to be a poll worker or a um, absentee counter. And because um, I've worked both in Melford Township. So, and they had a few, we had some questions about how do you determine if this person has already voted absentee and they're trying to vote in person a second time and how do we how do we do that and how do we handle rejected or spoiled ballots on both ends so we talked all about that and so you answered all the questions right <laughs> to, yes yes <laughs> kind of gave them an overview and made sure they understand it's a very long day and um you know even though the polls close at eight doesn't mean you leave at eight and um, that it's um, very interesting and it's, it's great to be a part of the process. What, what, what happens if it takes longer than a day to count? Yeah. Well, you know, I'm not real sure. We um, and the absentee world last, the primary did not leave the township offices till 1.15 a.m. and we'd been there since 6.30. So um, that's one of the things that the legislature is also considering um, yes. and that hopefully we can have passed, which is that, you know, that there can be shifts. Obviously, it's going to be it. I, I think it's a foregone conclusion that all the absentee ballots are not going to be counted um, even you know, in the middle of the night. And so making sure that the closing process is actually the most important process to make sure that the precincts are balanced. And so how do you make sure that you have potentially fresh eyes, or at least not, you know, people that have been there for 18 hours. Um, and, and it, I've heard that and it would be good. The precincts are, uh, in the absentee side of it, are balanced on an um, hourly basis to uh, try to make, catch any mistakes that might have been made or any errors that show up on that. And that way, by the time you get to the eight, close to eight o'clock, you should be not be out of balance and should be able to finish up. But the sheer volume is also an issue because the machines are very accurate, but they are, um, they only do so many ballots at a time, you know, one at a time. And it takes about 10 minutes, if I recall, but to do 50 ballots. So you, with it, with no problems. So, um, you know, it's just a, it's a time process also. And I will say that there's, you know, there's some differing, different precincts do things differently. So I know there's some that, you know, um, one of the big things our challengers are there for is actually for if there is a ballot that's spit out as incorrect, right? So if there is a mark that they need to have people look at, if there is any issue, um, and one of the precincts and I know one of our big absentee counting centers actually waited to the end of the night to adjudicate all of those. Mm -hmm. So essentially some of our challengers were sitting around most of the day, kind of just like watching them put ballots in and then that whole adjudication process was happening at night. And so that's when they started that process. Yeah. So, um, and then they had to balance everything. So it's all going to be based. I think we learned a lot in the primary um, and we had folks in a lot of the priority places to be able to learn um, and be able to provide some feedback. I agree. And I think that that, I think they got a lot of feedback about that because if you hold it till after the polls close, it takes a long time to deal with all of those that have been rejected and you're seeing whether you can, uh, they can be reprocessed. I will say I only have three minutes. If there are any like very specific voter protection program questions that came up in any of your groups, I would love to be able to answer them before I head off. Just one thing about it's about it's actually about COVID and um, the protections for the poll uh, challengers or poll workers. Um, how are those things being addressed? Yeah, so that was a question I addressed in our meeting. Um, so all of the staff are required to wear masks. Um, so whether you're a poll worker or if you're a challenger, um, if you're going to be there all day, you're required to wear a mask. I mentioned voters are not required to wear masks. Um, the governor has obviously had the executive order in place that everyone is strongly encouraged to wear masks. Um, but she did say for the primary that if you wear a mask, you are still able to vote. But I will say that the governor and the CARES Act that we got money from the federal government has been giving lots of money to the local municipalities for 
hand sanitizer for, you know, extra tables to move things as far apart as possible to make sure that people are socially distant. Um, and everybody's been thinking through plans. Um, the our Biden team and our party has also bought some PPE of for challengers. So different, you know, additional masks, hand sanitizer that we're going to be placing at some of our different absentee counting boards um, and just to be able to provide supplemental PPE for places. Does that answer? Yes, I guess. Um, I, there's probably nothing you can do about ventilation. One of the things that concerns, you know, I've heard people be concerned about is being enclosed in a space. So I know that a lot of places are trying to figure out like um, different locations, right? So they're trying to use bigger facilities mm -hmm. um, for that reason, specifically of like, how can we, you know, if we usually just do it in the clerk's basement, can we make sure that we can use potentially like a whole high school gym to count ballots um, and really just thinking about ways to be able to be in bigger spaces um, to buy fans. And I know that the party has been buying a ton of fans to be able to place in different locations um, to increase ventilation and really think through that with the clerks. Like I said, we have a whole team in place that is you know, building these relationships and that's going to be definitely one of the questions that we're asking because I think it is a it is voter protection issue, right? It's not only our volunteers, but people are, um, we want to make sure that people feel as comfortable as possible to vote. Thank you. Well, Brittany, this is a great, and I think we'll still be discussing this because we all hear some pieces and not other pieces, but it's such a great foundation. So to understanding the different roles and it's just so, I mean, everybody, we're, we're working so hard prior to election day and sometimes we lose focus on how many shenanigans go on on use one of Joe's words, you know, all that malarkey that goes on on election day. Yeah, um, our team is looking to minimize the malarkey. I think it's a t-shirt in that, minimize malarkey. Um, <laughs> That'd be amazing. Maybe if this whole lawyer thing doesn't work, I'll be a greeting card writer. Yeah, you know. <laughs> but thank you so much for thank your you time when you're so busy that you got like another meeting at eight o'clock tonight. So we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I really Thank appreciate you. it. Um, feel free to email me. Um, I can definitely connect you with our regional team. Um, and, you know, I think we, we got to this meeting because I did the swim meeting. So if there's another organization, um, I'm, I'm, feel, I'm free to work the circuit, as they say. Uh, have a great night all. Thank you so much. So uh, next on the list, let's go up from the bottom, would be Nancy. Check. Hi. Yeah, I'll pretty much the same thing that Nancy Weeks did. Um, I was a poll worker. I never worked the absentee ballots. Uh, this was the first year I actually worked the polls. So I answered questions about the polls. Um, I would add one thing that I didn't mention in our group is that um, Highland, uh, which is where I had worked the polls, they do offer shifts for poll workers. That's not true because for the poll uh, ballot counters, uh, the absentee ballot counters, because they have to be sequestered. But poll workers, many of them require you to show up at 6 a.m. and stay until 9 p.m., roughly 9 p.m. when the polls, after the polls have closed and you close up, um, er everything's put away and taken away. But Highland does offer uh, shifts, so if you're interested in just doing a shorter day, uh, they start at 6 a.m. I think 6 a.m. They, they have like three different half, like not really half shifts. They're actually a little long. They're, they're still pretty long. So if you're interested in doing a shorter shift, you can uh, contact Tammy Flowers at Highland. And then Janet Prang. Yeah, our group, uh, we just, I just went over what my experience was. Uh, I told them it's a long day. It, how long the day is, uh, I think if you're an actual poll worker, not an absentee voter ballot counter, which I've never done that part, but if you're a poll worker, I think a lot of it depends on how well run the, the group that, like I was a newbie, so the other people <laughs> had done it before. And we had that thing that Nancy was talking about that you had to have the ballots, uh, like how many ballots were given out, match up with how many ballots uh, have been run through the machine, uh, including the spoil ballots and all that kind of stuff. They did that like every two hours. They kept a little running tab every two hours to make sure that everything balanced out so that at the end of the evening when the, at eight o'clock and we didn't have anybody still in line, so at like 8.05, 
we were done and we were getting the ballots together and getting them into the lockbox and all that kind of stuff and everything matched up. We didn't have any problems. The thing that makes you go longer is if there's a huge line of people waiting to get in, mm -hmm. you know, after the polls quote unquote close, but they're in line. And the other part that can make it go later is if there's discrepancies, because you can't close it out, shut it down and take it to the clerk's office until you have accounted for everything. And multiple people have to sign off on that. And they have some people who are identified as Democrats there that in the poll workers and some that are Republicans. And you have to have one Democrat and one Republican sign off on the thing saying that everything was done correctly before you send it in. It was a good day. Long, but good. Sounds good. All right. And then Liz, you're the last group. Ryan Marianne had asked about, you know, can a couple go together to be a challenger? And, and she did say, as we were told as indivisibly, that you could, you might just have to travel a bit because there are going to be certain precincts that they're going to want a higher percentage of challengers and people observing. So you might just, it might change where you're going to go, but you could probably request that and do that. And then just redefining what is the difference between a poll observer and a poll challenger. And everybody's kind of a poll observer. Um, challengers can actually talk to the, the poll workers and you have to be a Michigan resident. You can have observers don't have to be. Their communication then is through, like would be through Brittany's group. So everybody, just show of hands. Was the breakout, was that helpful? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Oh, good. It's only the second time we've done breakouts. And so it's nice to have that kind of response because it is a more of a challenge to our, our guru here when we ask him to do all these things. And he's always up to the challenge, but I always want, hopefully it's going to be successful. So we did have, real quick, let me share this from the chat because we did have Emily from Julia's campaign here. If you did the lit drop for Julia and Karen, you met her in Karen's backyard the other day. And basically she was just, she wanted to speak, but she had to jump off for another call too. Um, so she just really wanted to thank everybody who came out to the lit drop because it was really well attended. I hope ours is as well attended. <laughs> just telling you, you know, it's two weeks from tomorrow. So be there, be square. And you will be getting notices upon notices, including probably a text blast. So just be prepared. And, and she wanted to, and there will be more lit drops if people want to continue to do that. As long as the weather's nice, it's a pretty decent way to spend a couple hours. And also to remind you that we are hosting Indivisible Huron Valley because a good percentage of our membership are hoping that Julia will be representing them in the coming year. Um, we are hosting a text bank for her on the 23rd from 11 to 1, doing one for Haley the week after that. You know, we're just zooming on our Denise ones. As I said, we are winning the contest. Okay, you're so, still with my 2020 report. Oh, it's I'm not, sorry. Just well, I, just, that, I just wanted to say what she had to say to thank us all. Oh, okay. And it's not a text bank. It's a phone bank, but I'll get to Right, that. right. I, I'm sorry. I knew that. I probably, I probably just misspoke. Sorry about that. Boy, I'll be good at one o'clock in the morning if I'm counting ballots, won't I? Um, <laughs> so if you want to get in touch with her, her email and the link for the Julia events is in the chat. So hop on the chat and copy those out if you want them. So that said, we can go to our team reports while we still have everybody here. Nancy is going to show us real quick the wonderful way you may use your phone to get onto that wonderful website and volunteer for stuff and check out what's going on. Okay, everybody take out their phone. What you're going to do with your phone is you're going to um, search on the internet for indivisiblehv.com. And then uh, in the, if once you get there, is everybody there? Kind of give me a raised hand if you're there. Okay, great. All right. In the upper uh, right hand corner, you'll see a black square with uh, three white lines. Those are hamburger lines, they call them. 
you click on that, that'll bring down the menu. The bottom item in the menu is uh, the calendar. So basically, I don't know if you can see, I'm gonna try to get you to see this. You'll see, this is the Indivisible site. You can see the hamburger right there. You're going to click on that and it'll bring you this menu. And then the bottom item is the calendar. And actually, I like the calendar, how it functions on the phone better than on, the, uh, on your laptop. And if you scroll through the, down the calendar, what you'll see is a yellow circle for today's date, which is the 9th. And then at the bottom, it is backwards on my screen, but at the bottom, you'll see uh, the list of activities that are on our calendar for today. And if you click on one of the items, just click on the first item, the Nicole Braden item, you will see on that item everything you need, including the link to register. So just to show you, here's Nicole Braden's. And if you go through, you'll see the link to register. And there's one more thing that I'll point out. You'll see at the bottom, this thing that says the key and it's all color coded. That actually, if you look very carefully, this is the part that's not so good on the phone, but if you look very carefully, there's a line, a very thin line between the time and the name of the event. So here, if you look at Nicole Braden, the time for Nicole Braden's event, and then you look over uh, next to it, you'll see uh, the name of her event, and there's a line separating the two. If you look at that, that is colored, doesn't look that way, and it coincides with that, with, with uh, the key. And so that'll tell you whether it's an action, a candidate forum, et cetera. Um, also, it's very easy to know who the event is for because the first thing is the name of the candidate. You'll see Braden, Stevens, and then for ours, you'll just see our title. The reason I'm pointing that out is the next few weeks are going to be very busy. Everybody wants to do something. And what I found that I do at the uh, end of the week or the beginning of the week is I sit down and I actually, I'm old school, so I actually will get a piece of notebook paper and just write out what I'm going to do every day. And in order to, to uh, make my calendar. First, I put in all the things I need to do, like doctor appointments, vet appointments for my dog. And then I figure out what I can do for a candidate, whatever days that I'm free. Uh, so you could just, it's very fun to do because all you can, what you can do is just go through the events and just click, uh, go through the calendar and you can quickly see the whole list of all the activities. So um, Saturday is a really busy, busy day this week. You can see there's a whole list of things that, of activities you can participate in. So anyways, that, that's it. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, just unmute yourself and ask. Okay, great. Then pass that back on to Liz then. As my favorite student Gabe would say, you a genius. Just saying. That's what Gabe used to say. And you are. <laughs> Um, I'm going to like jump down when nobody has the agenda in front of them, so, me, so it's okay. Since this segues really well into Democracy 2020, and we'll let Sherry go next, since we just talked about doing stuff, she's going to tell us about all the stuff we can do. <laughs> okay, here goes. Um, three dates you need. They, they're, they're on Nancy's handy dandy calendar that she just showed you, but I'm just going to bring to the to your attention three really important dates to mark down. The first one is September 17th, which is a week from tomorrow. Thursday, Thursday between 5 and 630 at Central Park Pavilion. We're going to have the kickoff gathering for Denise Forrest's literature drop. Now, a literature drop, if you don't know what that is, that's where you get a list of addresses. You go and you don't knock on a door. You actually hook a piece of literature on the doorknob. And, um, and that's what we're going to be doing for Denise. There's 4,000 pieces of literature that we're going to be delivering in Highland and White Lake. So we need lots of volunteers. So I'm hoping everybody will show up on Thursday, September 17th. 
We will talk to you that night and give you packets of the, not only the hangers, but also directions, a map, and a list of the addresses. What we found after doing uh, Julia Pulver's lit drop on uh, Monday is that it takes between two and a two and a half hours, maybe a hair more in, with the list that we've got set up. Um, so it's good to work with a partner. Most of the uh, places that we'll be dropping lit are what we call drive and drop kinds of things. They're not really walkable neighborhoods as such like they would in the Milford Village. So in, uh, you might want to do it in two different uh, shifts, maybe do, do it over two days. Um, unless it's a beautiful day and you're feeling energetic and you want to knock them all out, but that's probably going to work better. But if you cannot come on the 17th, but you still want to help, um, I'm going to put my phone number in the chat and you can give me a call and I'll drive your packet and information to you. Um, but if you don't want to sign up tonight, in fact, if you are interested, please put your name in the, sh in the chat if you think you can volunteer to do the lid drop. And the reason for that is if we know approximately how many people um, are coming, that'll help us do the packets. Some of you may have already signed up at our last meeting. If you did, that's fine, we've got you. Uh, but if you weren't at the last meeting and you wanna put your name in the chat, that would be helpful. Okay, that is the first one. Okay, the second date is September 23rd. Uh, from 11 o'clock in the morning to one. And that is our phone bank for Julia Pulver. Now, Julia Pulver has to win. If she doesn't win, we probably won't take the state house. And if we don't take the state house, that means Governor Whitmer is open to uh, losing a lot of her executive power. Uh, that's really what's happening, that we need her to have to protect us from the pandemic. So a lot is writing on us flipping the state house. And um, so this will probably be our last organized event we'll do for Julia, who is our swim adopted candidate and a whole chunk of our members live in the 39th in commerce. So we're hoping you guys will come out and sign up. That event is on our Facebook member page. You just need to go to the mobilize link and click and sign up for that. And like all of our indivisible Huron Valley phone banks, there is an element of fun. And so we get together at the end of our phone calling and we have a little chat, we have a drawing for a prize, and maybe there'll even be a party game. So we try to make them as interesting as possible. So that will happen then. And the other phone bank is on September 30th. And that one is for Haley Stevens. Abby called me and said, Sherry, we're really running behind on contacting voters in your part of the 11th district and I need you guys to help Haley. So that's why we're doing this one. You know, we don't want to lose her. We don't want her, you know, to lose that uh, seat in Washington, DC. We want to get her back there. The only other thing, so those are those three things. September 17th, September 23rd, September 30. Those are three indivisible Huron Valley events. Now, one of the other things that you may have noticed missing is usually about now we have a forum for down ballot candidates and nonpartisan candidates. We did it before in 2018 and everyone loved that because it gave them a lot of knowledge about who to vote for. Because of uh, absentee ballots, the actually voting time moving up and not getting the information, Nancy has been kind enough to do some research and she and Liz and I will be presenting to the steering committee sort of a roster of candidates that we recommend as a steering committee. And we'll send those out to the membership. They can take that information or leave it, but it's to help them in, in, uh, when they mark their ballot for uh, some of the, um, the, the offices that we aren't really sure about because they're, they're nonpartisan. That's it. I'm sorry. It was a little long, but there was a lot. I needed to get it. So. The lit drop event is, you don't, we're not, we're not. No, thanks. We're not door hanging then. We know it's going to get dark. <laughs> You're just going to be picking up your stuff and hopefully within that window prior to, you know, like within the week to 10 weeks after that, which is when people will start getting their right. absentee ballots. Hopefully you will complete your task at 
during that period of time. Yes. Um, at your convenience. It's, it's, you're not, you're only talking to people if somebody happens to be home. I think when I did Julia's, of the 68 houses we went to, um, I talked to three or four people that were in their yeah. yard and they wanted to know about the candidates. So. I think we've set the 25th as a deadline to get your, your list done. Yeah. Um, yeah, we won't be doing it that night. That's just a social gathering to kick off the uh, the whole drive. So, <laughs> with snacks, with snacks. That's right, with, with snacks. snacks. Yes, thank you. Don't forget the snacks. I won't. Cookies. Cookies. <laughs> Personal protection of equipment, please. Denise and Lyle have generously um, decided to have some Biden postcards printed. And there are a lot of people within the group who have said, what can we do for the Biden campaign? Since most of our focus is grassroots, we're going to put up a picture of this beautiful card that Pat Buckner developed. And Denise is going to talk to you about it a little bit, and then we'll give you some insight into where we're at with this. Um, we're going to handle this in a very similar way as the voter registration postcards. So Pat and I, We'll have these 500 cards and pass them out to those who are willing to fill them out. You don't need to say very much because the values are on the front of the card along with the names. Just something as simple as dear so-and-so, a vote for Biden-Harris team is a vote for a better America. Something similar to that. And thank them and sign it. So it's very simple. So if uh, others would like to get cards, please let us know now. Uh, we will be contacting people, but would welcome people to volunteer now. Thank you. Okay, and I'm gonna add to this. There's actually 5,000 cards, not 500. <laughs> I didn't catch that. <laughs> uh, there's actually 5,000 cards. We will have 5,000 addresses. We have about 3,000 now that the Democratic Party provided for the voter registration cards, and we're going to get 2,000 more. Um, we have worked up a couple sample scripts that we're going to put. We're going to put together packets of 50. Um, I can use as much help as possible. So if this is something you would like to help with, because it would just be helpful to me. So I'm not doing this all on my own. Um, <laughs> we have a couple of scripts made up. So each packet will have some directions. We'll have some suggested scripts, though certainly you're, if you feel passionately and want to go off script. But one of our scripts we came up with is, you know, I'm voting for Joe Biden because, and fill in your own personal message. And then we finished them up, both of them up with vote in person on November 3rd or request an absentee ballot now from your local clerk or we'll put the website on the card as well. Mm -hmm. So, and then you will get a list of addresses to go with it. Um, we're asking people to donate the, um, the postage, but if you can't do that, we certainly understand. We'll take them back and, um, you know, we'll, we'll figure out, we'll get postage taken care of somehow. The email that's at the top of the card here will not be on the card, but that is an email you can use and we'll go out on a newsletter, people who are interested. Pat's willing to like shoot those names to me so I know who to get them to. I still hear Lyle talking. Did you have something? <laughs> Am I talking over you, Lyle? <laughs> no, I'm helping okay. Denise write down people's names and how oh. many cards they'll take. Oh, good, because you could send that to me, right, with your daughter's address. That, then I don't have to go in there and write them all down. That would be perfect. Um, because we're, we'll set up some um, distribution sites like we've always done where you can just come grab them off of somebody's porch so that you can do that at your convenience. So we sent out a lot of cards. I get that. These will be easy ones to write, nice short script, and they will be hitting people who tend to be last minute voters. So it's a good time for them to go out. So that all said, thank you all, because I know you'll all step up. Okay. Well, one other comment, uh, that list of addresses is made up of Dems who have not been voting regularly and underserved people, as I understand it, so. Yeah, and they're all over. I was looking at the list today. Yes. They're in all kinds of communities, all over the place. <laughs> yes. um, so it's nice that, um, 
to have the addresses to go with it though, because it's hard to find 500 people in your own personal database, at least it is for me. And most of my friends vote, so there you go. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we'll get these names and that would be perfect. And we'll get the word out since there's only a you know, handful of the membership. So thank you, Denise and Lyle for your generosity and be careful in that RV. <laughs> we want lots of fun. Lots of pictures. We're going to do a whole meeting around this trip, I think. <laughs> well, it could be boring for most people because part of it's in Iowa and part in Nebraska and Kansas. Well, as well nice, as Colorado. <laughs> nice, flat, straight driving for a lot of it, though. Look at it that way, you know? Democratic stronghold. Yeah, all red states. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But put your big Biden sign on the back of your RV. Well, I'm going to take those postcards and have our family members fill some out as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. You're going to tell me where to send you 500 cards, right? Yes. All right. Excellent to you. <laughs> um, great. Okay, perfect. John has taken over our Saturday morning meetings. And if you, if there's a little core group of us who always show up, but I'm going to tell you, we're having some amazing discussions. And he, he comes prepared with, I don't know how many topics and we get to a couple of them, but it's really fun. If you have an hour, we moved him to every week. And I guess I shouldn't say all this, John can say it, but I'm just gonna, it's an, I'm gonna do the commercial. Worth your time, go John. I mean, I couldn't really do any better. I mean, if you really enjoy it, then I might as well have the advertisement come through you. <laughs> so, yeah, we've moved it to every week um, just because we're getting so close to the election. And, you know, one of the things you need to do is let some steam off and talk about things and just get energized. So that's kind of what this meeting is intended to be. It's not supposed to be like drive your nose into the ground writing postcards or anything. We're just trying to get pumped up. Um, we've had a lot of conversations about different things, about how uh, different music you like to listen to. That one's, we didn't have much to talk about on that, but uh, different um, political things like what the Lincoln group, Lincoln project is, how it'll affect us in the future, what, what kind of benefits, pros and cons, and yeah, like Liz said, I come up with a list of like 10 or 12 things and we usually get stuck on one or two because it's such a good conversation. Um, so yeah, if you want to come or if you have any friends who don't really necessarily want to get hardcore into anything but are political and want to talk some things through, go ahead and invite them. Maybe they'll get excited to do some stuff in the other meetings. So, What time and where? Uh, I believe it's at nine o'clock on Saturdays. Is that Morning. right? Where? <laughs> well, you can the... sign up on the calendar, Connie. It's uh, there's a Zoom registration. Oh, where, where is it though? It'll be in the email. I send it out in the email every oh, week. So it's, it's Zoom location. No, it's, it's a Zoom. Zoom. Oh, it's a Zoom. I'm yep. sorry. Yeah, so it's it's it low. Like it was before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's low overhead, so we don't have to. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to get out of your pajamas if you want to stay there. It's been I, known to happen. We'd prefer you to get out of your pajamas. <laughs> now, I will tell you, it takes something when it gets nine o'clock, which was because Sherry and I have a standing Saturday meeting on at ten o'clock now every week. But it takes something for me to want to sit on a meeting at nine o'clock. And I look forward to it because it's just interesting to hear what people have to say. And, and it's just so much more relaxed. So yeah. I would recommend stopping by and just see what you think. Thank you for the endorsement. No worries. <laughs> I'm good at that. I am a good cheerleader. I couldn't do a cartwheel, so I have to do it this way. Um, okay, let's see. What else do I have? Okay, Connie. Connie has an absentee voter event coming up. First, uh, I'd like to thank everybody um, for uh, phone banking with us. If you phone banked with us, um, we, would, we really appreciate it. Sorry about that. Decline. More, more phone banking. So, <laughs> <laughs> pretty sure it was another phone banker. Now, um, anyway, um, there's, uh, just for your information, there are 
that's, this was last week, 20,400 ballots ready to mail out in D44. And 40% of those will be mailed in the first 10 days, be mailed back of, of receiving them. So we are planning a week of um, get out, get to, to get, get Denise's name out. Um, Monday, September 21st is our kickoff phone bank. We'll have special, a special guest possibly. We'll have tips and secrets to be, make you a super phone banker. Um, that's it, September 21st. Then we have our, our, our whole week where we're gonna have special events at all our phone banks. Our special, we'll have trivia games and things to make it fun. And then we're gonna finish up on Saturday uh, with a marathon. So um, that'll start at 10, I think, and end at four. And we're hoping to make about, 1600 calls um and um just so you know um so far we've made uh everybody that's participated will attest to this 7800 calls so far since we started we started phone banking in may and yeah. uh, we've left over 3300 messages on people's answering machines and we've made 912 uh, contacts with uh, strong supporters. So please join us. We really, um, phone banking is the main, uh, is our main thing now until election day for uh, talking to voters. That's the one thing we can do to get people to actually know Denise's name and show up at the polls and vote for them. So I have that. We also have an Ask the Candidate event coming up. That's on thir this coming Thursday between 12 and 1. And Denise will be online and she can answer any questions that you have about, um, about her views and her plans. And then I will turn it over to Denise because she has a couple of little announcements too. So Thank go you. ahead, Denise. Thank you very much, Ms. Connie. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks again for everything you do. Thanks in advance for uh, the fabulous lit drop that's coming up with our 4,000 uh, door hangers. They are in process. Takes a little extra time to cut the, uh, to die cut those little hangers so it'll be easy access to folks' uh, doorknobs and what have you. Uh, so, um, looking forward to that. We're also, I'm also participating this Saturday, September 12th uh, in Waterford. Uh, the 44th has four precincts in Waterford. So we're kind of doing, um, uh, we're doing a lit drop. I'm partnering with uh, John Paul Torres, who is running for uh, Waterford Township Supervisor against an incumbent that, um, similar to uh, my opponent is not the best fella in the world. So uh, John <laughs> Paul uh, came with an, I don't know, 700, 800 votes of the incumbent uh, in the primary. So that's a very positive thing. We're also partnering with someone running for um, a township treasurer, Eric Lindenmeyer. So the three of us are putting uh, our all into a Saturday lit drop if anybody is interested they can uh, call me or email me and we can put that someone could put that in the chat 248-701-7553 or vote forest 44 at gmail.com so if you can, can snag some of you you can put your boots that were made for walking on and um we have that going on. So I feel like these four precincts in Waterford are gonna be pretty important. They're pretty highly democratic. So really I wanna get my name out there. And you know, if I can uh, tack on with John Paul, who seems to be doing a pretty good job of getting folks um, knowing his name and out to the polls, I think that'll be good. And then and um, this is just kind of was finalized uh, yesterday, but on September 15th, which is next Tuesday, I'm going to uh, participate in uh, Sierra Club 
Michigan Forum with some of their endorsed candidates. They um, were going to be talking about what we can do in Oakland County and the surrounding areas of the county. There is calling, uh, they're calling this a green wave to promote um, the environment, a cleaner environment uh, locally in our area. So I'm pretty excited about that. So that's a Sierra Club Forum on Tuesday. It is from 5.30 to 6.30, possibly 5.30 to 7, depending on their participation. So I'll be talking for five minutes and then there'll be a round robin of questions for uh, the candidates that are participating. And so I will have, I don't have the information yet from the statewide chapter, but as soon as I do, I'll pass it on to uh, Indivisible and you guys can add that to Nancy's fabulous calendar. So uh, those are a couple of events coming up. So that's what I have for you. Thank you. Well, that is our agenda. Does anybody who's here have something they're just dying to share? No? Well, thanks for coming and thanks for staying through the whole thing. Thanks for volunteering. I'll be more than happy to get 50 packets of postcards to you. And uh, we'll just get this thing done, right? Like yeah. we won't be able to get drunk on election night because we won't know yet, but I figure like, oh, the week after we're going to have a hell of a party, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Okay. If we want Biden postcards, we just email you. But you can either email yeah. Pat at that, that address. Oh, okay. If you wanted okay. to be involved, even though she can do that remotely because she's up north right now. Um, or you can, or email. you can email me. Yeah. It, it, or, you know, we'll get them to you. But right now, what I'm picking them up off her porch, hopefully in the next couple of days. So I can print out all the stuff, but any help that people want to do putting the packets together, we'd love to have some together for the lit drop in case people want to pick them up that night. Okay. So if someone can save the chat, you'll have all that information in there too. So maybe someone yeah, already We know how that. to save the chat because we forgot to write down the chat one time and we needed it. So thank you, Denise. That's a good reminder. You're welcome. <laughs> we didn't know where to put those signs until we saved the chat and went back to it. So. Save the chat. Save, save the chat. <laughs> save the chat. It comes through in a very interesting form though when John sends it to you. It, took, it was like good for your eyes to try to figure it out. Okay. All right, so we will be back here in a month. We're not sure what the meeting will be. It will hopefully be something defining. I would like to personally, if anybody, there's, we've started, if you do our Facebook page, there's quite an interesting dialogue started about the proposal that affects the environment. The Sierra Club has one pos position and then somebody has posted a different position from a fairly reputable source as well. So it looks like it's one of those that are really going to have to be kind of teased out. So maybe we can get some more information on that at our next meeting. Elizabeth, I would encourage uh, everybody to watch uh, Rachel Maddow tonight because I think that she's going to have uh, a program that largely is going to be concerned about this uh, uh, Woodward book that just came out entitled oh, Great. Yeah, yeah, that's that's yeah. True. Uh, there are some very uh, revealing things that are said in that book. Okay. Uh, and since and they've the got COVID, to back it up. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and <laughs> since the COVID thing is uh, uh, right up there at the top of the heap, he is going to address that directly and how the poor leadership that we've had from Washington has dropped the ball. Good, Roy, thank you for the recommendation. Perfect. And just so you know, that would be a great topic for the Saturday meeting. Show up, Roy. <laughs> I think you and Marianne would enjoy it. Roy's uh, one of our well, other ex educators so. I'm, I'm currently reading Disloyal, but uh, when the, the Woodward book comes out, I think that's on my list too. I, I was just reading about it this morning and it sounds pretty interesting, yeah. Well, thank you, that's a great recommendation. Anything else? Watch Third? Rachel Maddow. <laughs> okay, your glass of wine, or I want one of whatever it was that Donna Rhodes was drinking earlier. 
<laughs> glass. So, <laughs> last night, <laughs> water. He, oh, bummer. It looked like a martini or something. <laughs> it was so, Rachel last night interviewed one, his attorney, but it's gone. Cohen. Oh, okay. Which was very good, too, with, yeah. with his book well, last night. Yeah, Peter, a good Peter's interview. stroke too was on Morning Joe this morning, and that was he's got a book out too. He's the guy that Trump vilified from the uh, security. Wow, and that was oh. mind boggling. There's and so many books out too. I want to get that one. It is amazing what goes on that gets accepted oh, by, my God. by a certain segment of people, okay. isn't it? Let's vote him out, okay? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Goodbye. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Liz. Good Thanks, trip to the Tylers. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, you have to go pack. <laughs> 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 Hurry.